Oh, my friends. Gosh, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for letting me come here. I am just kind of in, I know one of the titles about this talk is about disbelief. I'm kind of in disbelief that you guys want to come on a Monday night for a math lecture in the rain, so I'm super excited to share a lot of math with you. Um, you know, I've been a math professor for about 25 years, and, you know, when people think of math, um, when they come up to me and they realize that I'm a professor, two things happen. First, usually people who are older, because students are a little ashamed of this thing, but there's a sense of asking for forgiveness. Father, forgive me, because I hated trig. Like, Father, forgive me, because I did algebra, and I never took the next class afterwards. Like, there's like an incredible sense of, like, you failed. Like, like, I took calc, I hated every minute of it, I took an AP class, and I never had to take one in college. Like, there's kind of a shameful notion of math that happens on one side, because I think there's a lot of pain involved in math, so I'm still more amazed that you wanted to invite me as a mathematician to talk. Um, and the second thing that happens, and this is, to me, I find incredibly weird, is that people think I'm smart. They don't know anything about me. I'm just like, oh, you're a mathematician. Dude, you're smart. Why? I mean, I could be totally an idiotic kid. Somehow the fact that I'm a mathematician makes me amazed. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that math deals with perfect truth. So check this out, right? This is what I find gorgeously sexy about what I do. All right. Now, the sum of the angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees. Do you remember this from like geometry class? Some of you are bringing up painful memories as I say these words, right? But like, you know, the sum of the angles add up to 180 degrees. Now, how many humans have existed in the world? I don't know, billions and billions and billions and billions. And let's pretend each one of them is drawing a different triangle all the time. So you still have a finite number of triangles that have ever been seen by humans. And yet I am making a claim that every triangle, infinitely many of them, hold this truth. That's ridiculous. Basically, I'm able to hold infinity in my hand. Woo! That's why I find math amazing. Right? We can talk about a truth. It's not experiential. It's not like physics. I personally think you know, physics, they're bound by physical things. Experimental data, repeatable experiments, <gasps> whatever. Right? Math, I don't need to experiment anything. I just know this truth, that the sum of the angles of a triangle are 180. It's amazing to me how cool that is about math. And I think the world kind of understands that and associates that with being smart. Like somehow we're able to understand deep truths about things. Let me show you something, right? This to me is, um, is a spectrum that you might have seen before in different spots. Let's take a look if this thing works. I'm not sure if you guys can see this thing, but on the right side you have math on the spectrum of awesomeness. And as you kind of walk away, things kind of get worse, right? You have bio and physics and econ and history, and then over here you have literature and art. And when I say it gets worse, let me say this. As I grew up in India, and the amount of pride parents have on their kids is based on where on the spectrum you are, right? Oh, my kid, uh, he's, uh, he's studying math as an undergrad. Oh my gosh, he's small. <laughs> She's great, right? And it's like, yeah, my son's an artist. Oh, we'll pray for you. Right? It's just like, you just kind of know where you're going to stand. And I thought this was an Indian thing, and it turns out being a professor for about 25 years, I realized this is also an American thing. Like, it's kind of a universal thing that the more you're in the sciences and the math, you're kind of valued more highly. And the way you kind of go into the arts and the humanities, you're like, well, I guess that didn't work out, so we're here in English class. And this I find confusing because of this one catch. Let me show you what's really going on. You see, behind the scenes for all of what we think is true, there's this notion of complexity. You see, the science is the reason I am able to talk about a truth, about infinitely many things, about a triangle, is because I'm talking about triangles. It's the stupidest thing you can think of. I mean, like, a triangle, who cares? That's all mathematicians deal with. We deal with really easy stuff. We deal with spheres and tori and these funny shapes. But the more you move into biology and economics, and then you deal with history, oh my gosh, now you have something that is not a repeatable event. History happens once and you're done, and you have to now measure it. I mean, we're even now talking about the election that happened in the presidential world a few years ago, and the catch is, well, it's not repeatable. So how do you measure that event? How do you measure something that happened 200 years ago, much less 2,000 years ago and more? You need different sets of tools to do this, really difficult, amazing tools. All right, y'all, let me show you, if you're not convinced yet about this notion of complexity, let me show you this. 
I'm going to give you two parts of this slide, all right? The left side, this is a page from a book in quantum mechanics, all right? I literally took a page from a book in quantum mechanics. On the right side, I'm not sure if anybody can read this thing. I'm going to read you a few of these lines and see if you can guess what it is. There was less tampering and big talk then from Unfurt the boaster, less of his blather as the hall thanes eyed the awful proof of the hero's prowess. Anybody know what that is? Not Paradise Lost. It's my favorite book in the world, actually. So here are these two things. On the right side is quantum mechanics, and the left side is Beowulf. And my question is, which is harder? So you could kind of look at this and say, oh my gosh, yeah, quantum mechanics. Look at those symbols, square roots, ugh. I, some of you are leaving right now, realizing you never thought you'd have to see this, but you knew it was a math talk, come on. Right? You're coming in here, and you're like squared, not, you know, pluses and minus signs, you know what? That's just all notation. It'll take me like an hour, you got, oh, that's what they're saying, and it's done. It's kind of a simple thing that you can encapsulate this thing in a formula. Y'all, I'm married, I guarantee there's no formula that I know of to make my wife happy, right? It is not easy, but yet quantum mechanics is, because there's just a formula for it. On the other hand, you could spend a lifetime understanding Beowulf and not even scratch the surface of its beauty. So here we are. You know what, my friends? I think arts and the humanities, they're not rocket science. They're far harder than rocket science. Putting a man on the moon was actually easy. You know what's really difficult? Let me tell you what easy is. If you think about ideas of Tesla, maybe going to Mars, ideas of Elon Musk, Facebook, artificial intelligence, I think all of that is easy. We can do it. <laughs> Let me tell you what's really hard. Issues of race, issues of gender, Issues of equity, issues of justice, issues of war, issues of pain, understanding beauty. Those are the things we aren't getting. We've been here thousands and thousands, if not far longer as humans that are rational and written stuff down. We still haven't figured it out yet. We can put somebody to Mars and the moon. That's doable. <laughs> But figuring out those things, that's the real stuff, and that's what the arts and the humanities deals with. In fact, kind of the worst person to invite for a talk like this is kind of a mathematician. Anyway, moving on. Um, You know, let me tell you one other thing that does not deal with formulas, and that's raising kids. So let me show you. These are my kids, two beautiful children, and I have two other ones too, so I have four total kids. And if you notice, my wife, um, I'm Indian, my wife is Chinese, so the older three kids at the top, they kind of have this cool like Indian-Chinese touch. And then there's this fourth one, right, like down here. That's my favorite one. Let me show you a picture of her. Oh. We adopted her the day she was born, and she's been with us now for 10 years. She's my joy. Uh, and let me show you, if you think the notion of having a kid, of my wife in India, me, my wife in China, me in India, having these three kids in America in the 21st century is a mess, throw in a blonde hair, blue eyed girl into that mix, right? It is incredibly complicated and messy, and there's no mathematics that can take care of it. And to me, that is what I'm attracted to. That's what I want to try to figure out for. Like, I want to figure that out. Listen, y'all, we are looking, all of us are looking for answers to, I think, some of the deepest questions. We're not looking for answers for math formulas or physics or biology. We're looking for amazingly difficult questions. I then realized that the person who asks those questions, you get asked those questions on a weekend at three in the morning by DPS security. Do you know the questions they ask you? These are the questions I'm trying to find the answers to. They ask you, who are you? <laughs> what are you doing here? And where are you going? That's what I want to know. This to me is the punchline to everything. Which way do I live my life that can give me answers to this really well? Formulas don't work. I need something far more complicated. Listen, we're all living our lives because we have already answered these questions somehow. You all might think you don't have answers to it, but the reason you're making a choice is to call your mom or dad, the reason you're making a choice to follow somebody, the reason you're making a choice is to go to class or not, is because you're answering this question somehow. You got answers to this thing. You might not like your answers, but you got answers to them. Listen, we're making daily choices because we think the world works somehow. I want to tell you a story. This is from David Foster Wallace, a great writer, and he started one of his talks, a very famous talk by this thing. He said, um, I'm going to make it from Malibu. Two young fish are swimming in the Malibu waters, and an older fish like me with gray hair swims past them the other way. And as he swims past the two young fish, he says, hey, all, how's it going? How's the water today? And he keeps swimming. 
A little bit later, one of the young fish turns to the other young fish and says, what in the world is water? And to me, that's what this question's about. We don't even think about the water. We don't even realize there is water, but we're drinking something. We're smelling something. We're making choices based on something. Listen, let me show you what I think the kind of choices are happening. All right, to me, we have some kind of a choice of getting on some kind of a plane of the way the world works. Right? There are many thinkers and many people who live their lives who thought about how the world works. And here's some of them. Those who are Muslim, those who are Hindu, those who are Christian, those who are secular, they, they say the world is not designed by some other god. It is what you see it is. Secular humanists. It's a beautiful thing, by the way. I'm a fan. There are people who don't even care how the world works. Still, they're making choices based on the fact they don't care. You're still making a choice. And this is, to me, the weirdest one. Having grown up in India, I find this amazing. It's, I call it the American buffet, where people kind of build their own plane. Like, I like a little bit of Hinduism and a little bit of Buddhism, and I'll throw in a tail that looks like this. You know who's ever flown the plane? Nobody. Good luck with that one, right? But there are a lot of people, billions for Hindus and billions for Christians who have thought about these things. And you have to pick one of these planes or build your own. And then you've got to get in, and that's how you're going to base your life on. You've got to leave your life in flying that plane. To me, I will tell you what I'm driven by. Before I tell you the plane that I like, I'm going to tell you what I'm driven by. And to me, I'm driven by one amazing word, which is the word, hmm? Pish. This is it. So I'll tell you why this word is amazing to me. Okay. I don't know if you know the life of a college professor. I teach about two classes a semester. So let's pretend I teach like Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock. You know what I do at 11 o'clock? Whatever I want. You know what I will do rest of Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Whatever I want. Tuesday, Thursdays, there I am having scotch in my office. Whatever I want. What do I do on the weekends? Whatever I want. What about summer break? Three months? Whatever I want. I work six years. You know what I'm doing next year? Literally, after working six years in San Diego, I'm on sabbatical leave. You know what I'm doing then? Whatever I want. I love being a professor. There's no company telling me what to do. Nobody telling me the ideas to think about. I can think of anything I want, draw pictures on anything I want, work on whoever I want to work on with. I love freedom. But let me be clear, my friends. When I talk about freedom, let me be clear as to what I'm saying. There is um, an American notion of freedom that I find different, having grown up in India, and that notion of freedom says things, it's like Disney freedom. It says things like, follow your heart. Y'all, my heart is stupid. I don't know if you guys know my heart at all, but like sometimes I really want to save up and buy a Bugatti. Like I just really want that, and sometimes I think that's the idiotic move. Sometimes I want to move out of San Diego and check out the world, and sometimes I think I have a house in San Diego. Why would I want to leave it? I just don't know what my heart is saying sometimes, and I don't know how to follow it. Sometimes people say, pursue your dreams. Have you heard that? That's what freedom is about, pursuing your dreams. I want to be a linebacker for an NFL team. I do, but then my dreams turn out to be dumb. But then some people then say, don't give up on your dreams. But some people come up to me and say, dude, give up on your dreams. Your dreams suck. Uh, so I don't know exactly what I need to be doing. What am I following? Like, where is freedom really coming from? To me, freedom comes from wanting to live life well. Like, I just want to have a great life. I don't mean rich. I don't mean famous. I have zero interest in that stuff, but just like a good life. I think. I think the world has, has a grain going on it. And when I live my life, I don't want to go against the grain and get splinters. I just want to figure out what the grain of the world is. That's what I want to figure it out. And the different planes offer different ways of figuring out what the grains of the world are. So let me tell you what I love. I love freedom to live my life well, but I also love the second freedom, which is I want the freedom for our world. I love our world. So I love our world. I think the, our world is broken. You might not agree with it, but I think it is. I think there's social struggles. I think there's economic struggles going on. I think there's so much economic disparity that the people who are rich are rich that's ununderstandable. It's just wicked nuts ununderstand, making millions of times the amount that their employees are making. It's economically broken in so many ways. Environments are getting abused and destroyed. So I want a world that's gorgeous. I love this world, but it's broken. But at the same time, I find the world absolutely sexy. I think it's so beautiful. You know, I think bodies are beautiful. I think our hands are beautiful. Let me show you this picture. I'm not sure if you know this at all, but we have vinyl sales. You know, vinyls, like LPs, they're more popular now than in the history of the world. 
Now this I find kind of weird because Apple has Apple lossless digital files. That means it's flawless. The files are perfect. There's no errors. And yet we buy this junk, like a piece of plastic with some stuff scratched on it. You know why? Because the world is thirsty to touch things. We're tired of music that doesn't have any weight. Our bodies matter, and we keep abusing it. Do you know why you spend 30 bucks on a cup of coffee? Because you've ignored your body the whole day, and eventually your body goes, "You owe me something, dude. You owe me a $30 date." So you go to Starbucks and buy a cup of coffee for 30 bucks. I think tastes matter. We talked about what is amazing. Grater's ice cream is the best ice cream I know of. 1870, it was made in Cincinnati, Ohio. You can buy it at Ralph's. Right here, because it's owned by Kroger. Oh my gosh, it's amazing! So I know the world is beautiful, and I know the world is broken, and I will not escape to Mars. I want to fix this world because I love it. I want some worldview that allows me to live well and my world to live well. That's what I'm looking for. So what's my choice? To me, I think the Christian faith, that that airplane, that choice, that story makes the most sense to me. Listen, you all. I want to be really clear. I don't trust the Christian faith because it's emotionally satisfying. I'm a mathematician. I have no emotions to satisfy.、Right? Listen, the reason I trust quantum mechanics—you know, quantum mechanics—it's a theory about particles. It's about theory about forces, strong forces, weak forces. You know, I've never seen any particles. I don't know those forces, but I trust it. I mean, that's kind of what I believe the world is working like. Why do I buy quantum mechanics? Because it's the best explanation for how the world, the physical world, is working. That's why I buy it. Give me another theory, and I'll switch out of that and pick something else. I'm ready to go. But to me, the best explanation how the entire world works is the Christian story. It makes the most sense to me out of everything. It gives me incredible life to lead my life well, but it shows me actually how to fix and love our world. It makes amazing sense. Now, let me be really clear about this. This goes back to the title of the talk a little bit that we've been talking about, which I don't buy the Christian faith 100%. I'm kind of 60% sold on it. Right? That's how that's how much I trust that plane. I'm 60% trust in that plane. The Hindu faith, I trusted about 20%. Secular humanists, you know, the atheist faith, I I think it's a gorgeous plane. I trusted like 48%. But I got to get in on one of those planes to live my life, right? And certainly, the build-your-own plane ain't happy for me. So, out of all the planes, the Christian faith makes about 60%, and that's why I'm getting on that plane. But the problem when you get on a plane is you're 100% committed, because the plane's in the air, and you got to live your life that way. So, I'm all in to a thing I only buy 60% of, all right? And that's how it is. You know what? I'm a kid who grew up in India, living in 21st century America in San Diego. What do I know? Very little. But I got to choose something, and to me, that makes the best choice. Listen. Here's what the Christian story says to me: Our world is broken, but it's at the same time beautiful. God pursues us in our history and helps us flourish and live life well, and equips us to make our world awesome. And He Himself comes down to hang out with us to do this, not somehow demanding obedience, but actually just the opposite. He gives up all His power in order to show us how to do this world. And to me, the best thing about this faith, the thing that resonates so much, is that one day my world that I adore will be set right again. That's what I'm so excited for. So, here's why. To me, I actually trust the story. I'm going to close with this. There are two things I think is fantastic. One, it's a story you can measure. If you go back to that first slide I showed you. The story is built on historical ideas, which means you could measure history. You could do it poorly, but at least you can measure it. There are events you could talk about. It's built on literature. It's built on poems and stories and prayer parables and and psalms and proverbs. And so it has a book of literature that you can use literary criticism to measure. Is it good? As a work of literature, is it good? You can use weapons to understand it. And to me, it's also grounded in the physical. No other story that I know of, no other worldview, is obsessed with the physical more than the Christian faith. To me, beauty matters, art matters, and the Christian faith adores it. So let me show you, just in the math world, what I, why this matters to me. So one thing that we did, a group of faculty and students in our team, is we built a sculpture, two tons, and we took it to Burning Man. 
It has to do with what an unsolved math problem is. You can actually open it up, get in. This is actually live at Burning Man in 2018. Close it up, and if you're inside, then this thing is what it looks like. It's filled with mirrors. It talks about an unsolved problem, about what the shape of the universe is, about the Poincaré dodecahedral sphere, which I'd be happy to talk about anytime you guys want. So that's what I really care about. Issues of actually touching stuff, bringing beauty into the world. What do I want to think about? The Christian faith echoes it and pushes it. And the last thing it does is it says that flesh and blood matters, like matter, matter matters. It's not going away. It's going to be redeemed and set right. This is why I got, shook some hands, got a million dollars, and I built a studio. The worlds that I know of only math studio, a place, you know how there's a physics lab and a chem lab and a bio lab? Why isn't there a math lab? Welcome. Right? It's awesome. There's like, it's basically a craft store with no technology in it except for a sewing machine. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. What does it mean to do math with your bodies? Because the bodies matter. My friends, in this world of skepticism and doubt, this is where my trust lies. It gives me freedom. It helps me redeem the world. Thanks for your time. So now we will move into the question and answer portion of the night. So if you guys have written down any questions that you would like to ask Dr. Devados, or if any come to mind, feel free to write them down and then uh, just throw up a hand and I will either come give you the mic and you can ask him yourself, or if you'd rather, you can just write it on the little card we gave you and I can read it and have him answer as well. Um, just to kick things off while everybody's trying to think of questions, I have one that I would like to ask you. Yeah, please. And that is, at any point in your study of mathematics, did that 60% confidence in Christianity ever drop a little bit or in comparison to others mm. because of your studies? Um, so first of all, that number 60% is totally made up. But just to give you guys an idea, because what do I know how to quantify such things, right? But just to give you a feel for it. Um, but I, the one, there are a couple of ups and downs that happen, but I don't think it's more about actually understanding math because I think it is trying to answer very simple things. It's trying to answer patterns. One of my be- some of my best friends in the world, my colleagues are mathematicians. And many of them I know are diehard atheists, like diehard secular humanists. And we're having beer together, coffee together, having pizza together, breaking bread together, talking about amazing math. And I look at a result, and they say that is the sexiest thing ever. And I say that's the sexiest thing ever. And then that's great. So I don't think math has ever pulled us apart in many things. But there are a couple of things where math has helped me understand things. And I'll tell you just one example. There is a funny pattern called the Penrose tiling. Uh, Roger Penrose, who became Sir Roger Penrose, came up with this thing. It's a really pretty thing. And it's something that doesn't make sense in two dimensions at all. It's really, it's unpredictable pattern. But it turns out if you go to five dimensions, it's a very simple pattern of tiling boxes. And if you slice the five-dimensional world into a two-dimensional slice, just take a slice of it, that is the Penrose tiling. And so the, the catch to me that kind of helped me understand it is sometimes you need to introduce more complexity to bring simplicity. So a lot of times people say like, why do you need to have a notion of God? Like that just sounds idiotic. That feels like you're putting artificial junk on top of things, right? But sometimes if you bring a little more complexity, a lot of things that sound very weird become really simple. So to me, that's helped a little bit. That's super cool. All right, anybody else have anything they'd like to ask? Um, Would you say that having a skeptical worldview would make one more objective than having a religious worldview? Uh, a skeptical versus a religious one. Could you explain to me the difference? I'm, I think skeptical, I've just heard this argument that being skeptical would make you more objective mm. and that being overly religious or viewing the world in one dimension, have, like viewing the world in terms of like Christianity or Hinduism or Buddhism would make you less objective to I the see. truth. And yeah. so. I, I get, okay, that, I see skepticism in that way and religious that way. So I think... So my framing would be the following thing. I think any time you're breathing, you're in a religious worldview, whether you call it religious or not. And the religious doesn't have to be God. It just has to be you think the world is running somehow, right? You, you, whether you say, I trust my parents, that's your worldview. You just buy it from them, or you trust your community. Whatever it is, we, we all have our own worldviews. I think skepticism is awesome, because I think that's what math does. Mathematicians basically yell at each other lovingly. And that's what an argument is, that's what a proof is, that's what a theorem is. It's basically, to me, a mathematical theorem is trash-talking. 
It's like, boom, drop the mic, that's the truth, and that's why I'm right, right? It's awesome. And so in order for me to be so arrogant to say I know a truth about every triangle in the world, you gotta back it up, and you gotta have other people chew you out to make sure you can hold the test of time. So I think skepticism is what is built into mathematics. Every time I submit a paper to a journal, everybody who are re who's reading that journal, other mathematicians, are absolutely skeptical about my argument. And that's why mathematicians, mathematical journals are a lot of times double blind. They don't know who's writing it. They don't want my name to be influenced by it. And they don't know who the referees are to influence me. So that way they know, is, can this hold the test of time? I love that thinking, and I would love to bring it to everything we do. So as the Christian faith, when I talk about the 60%, if somebody can bring me more things, evidences, the way life works in another worldview and another thought, I'd be happy to think about that. In fact, I'm always chewing out the Christian faith. And it doesn't make sense in a lot of times to me, right? So I'm like, why is that not working? I think skepticism's awesome. To my wife's disappointment, I'm skeptical with her. That's the problem with our marriage, but that's a whole separate story, right? I hope that helps a little bit. Okay. Um, can I ask one more question? Sorry, yeah, sure. Just one more question. Um, do you have any tips for first-time authors who are wanting to get published in a journal? Oh, for, well, it depends on if, for tips on how to get published in journals. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you more about it. I guess it depends on the field. In math, I know a little bit, and that's about it. So, so do you think it's worse to be skept uh, skeptical to ask about like the question you said like, about the war, about equality and justice? Because like we have these issues from century to century, and we unsolved it. So, do you think as an individual we? God spent our time on it is... Oh, so you're saying, let me see if I can understand your question correctly. Yeah. You're saying um, we've had issues about war, about justice, about inequity for so long that yeah. what's the kind of the point of pushing, like if we can't figure out the solution for that thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. To me, I agree with you. So to me, there are two things that drive me. One is the notion of hope. And I think every one of us has the notion of hope or else we would be in a very difficult place. Like there's something in us that wakes us up in the morning and say, forget the war in Ukraine. I mean, there's a war in our neighborhood. There could be a neighbor who's annoying, right? There could be a friend in your roommate who wakes up at the wrong time. I mean, there could be war in your dorm room, right? And you could kind of say, there's always warm and always dorm rooms. Every roommate sucks and give up. Or you can say, maybe I can fix this one problem. So to me, the war, wars are doable. They can be fixed. And maybe not the bigger ones, but to me, the, what, the second part of the question that, I like, that you said I liked is, what attracts me is, why can we not solve those problems? Like, what is going on that we can't get that right? We somehow, as humans, can figure out some things, but we can't figure out some other stuff. And the notions of injustice, the notions of darkness, there are things we can't pretend don't exist. There, I think there is evil. And I think those are the kind of ways that that's why it keeps coming up over and over again. Rather than trying to solve it, seeing the bigger picture as to what's going on, that it keeps coming up. I hope that makes a little bit of sense. So basically you are like suggesting the evil is from human nature rather than like come some, you know, I think outside. Going, I think going back to the other question, there, each worldview has an answer to where evil is coming from, right? I, I have a Christian worldview as to where that answer is coming from. Partly it's because of our idiocy and partly it's because there are forces against us. But every worldview has an answer to that question, like where is this brokenness coming from? That's right. Now you've said uh, Christian faith a couple times, but what do you mean by that? Do you mean like Protestantism, Catholicism, or Orthodoxy? And if Protestantism, what branch of Protestantism? I'm just curious. Oh, about the Christian, f oh my gosh, yeah. Um, I have no particular branch of Protest. I guess, I would say Orthodox Christian. I don't know what that would mean, right? But basically kind of the classical tenets of the Christian faith, Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, right? In terms of exactly how that's lived out, whether it's Presbyterian to Roman Catholic to Orthodox, that's not interesting to me at all compared to these bigger questions. Okay, that makes, so the general idea of Christianity. Yeah, I'd say Orthodox Christianity, that's right. I would say that. Thank you so much. My pleasure, of course. At least that's what I was referencing in anything I was saying. That's right. A couple of questions here? Yeah. Hi. Um, how has your study of mathematics and Christian philosophical understanding influenced your perception of culture uh, coming from an a, uh, Indian American background? Oh, my gosh. Math, culture, Christian faith, how does that kind of all fit together kind of stuff? Yeah. Dude, man, I'm messed up. So, I mean, I grew up... When, 
Did you ever have con? What's your name? Matt. Matt, did you ever have conversations with your mom or dad or uncle or aunt about whether you should finish fourth grade? No. I mean, I'm sure that sometime in elementary school, you probably got picked on, you got in trouble. You know, like it was not an awesome, right? There was probably some year, right? Like never had that conversation. That's exactly what it was for me for a PhD. Okay. Never had a conversation with my parents. I was like, so should I get a PhD? They're like, it's like almost you saying, mom, fourth grade's looking tough. She's like, sucks to be you, Matt. Go back in, yeah. right? And that's exactly what I said. Mom, this is looking tough. Sucks to be you. Get back in, get to finish the PhD. PhD's the last train that ends. So to me, Matt, I never really fell in love with math. I just wanted to get a train, get on it, and get off the education train, which is a PhD, which for you was at least fourth grade, right? And you're in college, gonna get on that train, right? You keep going. So to me, it was that. And I just picked math on the way there. And later on, I fell in love with it. And to me, the, the kind of stuff that I ended up doing with math, I don't know if, it has really, if it's related directly to the Christian faith or not, but I will guarantee, because I don't want to make such a big claim, but I do want to guarantee it's related to a liberal arts education. I went to a liberal arts school, and my favorite class I ever took was aesthetics, the philosophy of art. And I guarantee the way I think about math is a lot through an artistic lens. Like, it's influenced everything I do. My PhD thesis was 20 pages with 23 pictures. It's like, C figure one, you don't get it? C figure two, you don't get that? C figure three. Like, it's just like, that's what my PhD thesis was. And so, like, I think that way. So it definitely impacted me through my college experience. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, growing up my entire life, I had a math teacher who... Um, hey, say that one more time. Growing up in your entire life? Growing up my entire life, I had a math teacher who studied apologetics at Biola. Oh, yeah. And so he would always, like, try to intertwine the two because I grew up in a Christian school. Yeah. So, and you said that the Christian faith was the one that made the most sense to you. Yes. So has there ever been, like, a point or a time where your work in mathematics has kind of, you know, given some type of strength to the Christian faith in, mm. some, one, in some way or given strength to the idea of a deity as a whole? Uh, the straight up short answer is no. I mean, what I find in math is that it's gorgeous. And to me, that's what hurts me the most when people don't like it. Right? Most people in the world, when they think about math, it's not, dude, you're in a sexy class. Nobody says that, right? Like, and that's what kills me. Why can't it be that way? Why can't math be the sweetest, most beautiful, amazing thing there is, rather than literature, right? Some people are like, oh my gosh, dude, that book is amazing. You got to read this, right? And you could think about music, you could think about art, but math doesn't get that. So to me, when I think of the Christian faith, I think of redemption, like how do you set the world right? And in the new heaven and the new earth, I think of math as an amazing thing you can continue to discover. Just like the amount of ice, have you guys ever seen the movie Ratatouille? One of the best movies ever. Brad Bird, one of the best directors ever. Awesome, great, now that's out of the way. In Ratatouille, one of the rats is trying to explain to the other rat, the brother rat, what flavors are like, right? He's like, try the cheese, he tries the cheese. He's like, try the strawberry, try the strawberry. He's like, try the cheese and the strawberry together. And you get this flavor you've never had before if you tried them individually, right? And then he tries to explain to the rat how every combination of food could exist. To me, that's the new heaven and the new earth. Like, that's what the future looks like when the world is set right. We will spend an infinite time thinking about amazing ideas, and math is part of it. So to me, that's how I can answer that question from one setting. But using it as an apologetic lens, I don't think it's equipped for it, man. Like, I really don't think math is the weapon to, to open that can. I don't think physics is the weapon. You know, a lot of people get hung up on, like, biology and evolution and stuff. The first two chapters in the Bible are about that. And then God spends what, like an entire book on how to build a temple? He's obsessed with pomegranates. It's like, dude, why don't you tell us more about the giraffes? He's like, listen, whatever, first day, second day, the order's different, what, you know, we'll get to that later. If you even read the order for chapter one and chapter two of the book of Genesis, they're not the same. And it's like, dude, if you're gonna get that right, at least get that one right. He's like, not interesting. One's about power, one's about who's important, let's move on. And then he's like, but the pomegranates have to be here. It's like, what? And so you could see that God is like, God is obsessed to being an artist. Like, he wants things set for a different reason, and he's not obsessed about physics. So we kind of have it backwards in our world. Certainly in 21st century America, we're drinking the Kool-Aid in the wrong order. So to me, math is gorgeous, but that's not the reason to read scripture for me. Hope that helps a little bit. Awesome. Great. First of all, thank you for coming and, and for speaking at our, at our campus. Welcome yeah. to Pepperdine. Thanks. And um, I think something that's really helped me in my own spiritual growth and journey is, is prayer and personal revelation. And I'm wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about your experience or yeah. 
whether it's previous attempts or, or your routine that you have now, whether it be in meditation or prayer? Or... Gosh, yeah, what a great question. Um, let me actually tell you, instead of talking about prayer in particular, let me push a little bit about um, the physical. So, you know, if everything I claim is legit, if everything I believe is actually true, in other words, God is real, and the physical world matters, that means that God must somehow speak to me through physical things, not just through the mind, right? The reason I built that math studio was to say that math is not just about the mind. You know, physics is about physical things and about the mind. Chemists are about chemical, they're mixing chemicals and about the mind, right? They're thinking about chemistry, theoretical chemistry, they're touching chemistry. Biologists thinking about what genetics could do and then they're cutting organisms to actually mix, right, and do DNA. They're doing body and mind. Math, hmm. Right? You kind of like zone out and you're just doing brain stuff. And I don't want prayer that way. Right? Like if I really drink this Kool Aid that I'm giving y'all, that means prayer must also be about the body and the mind. Right? It's not just I'm thinking about God right now or I'm floating. It's that and an embodied state. That means God must not just touch me in my mind, God must touch me in my body. And the more I actually thought about it and actually prayed that way, there are times, I'm not sure if you've ever felt this, have you ever gone into a room, y'all, and it just feels like there's darkness in that room? Have you just gone in there like, dude, I should not be here, right? Like, I don't know whether it's an arcade room or a friend's, it's like something kind of hits you and it's a physical thing. And you've also gone into the room where you feel like joy, right? You feel like this is like a, fan- I just, have you ever gone to a home that feels so inviting? That's like, it's not even your home and it's like, I feel like I'm a home, right? Like, I feel like those are the physical things that we should also look for. To me, my prayer is partly mental, Right? Like I'm, I'm reading and thinking and like having a quiet, just to shut down the world. Even when I drive, I have a 25 minute commute door to door from my office and I don't listen to the radio. I don't listen to, po- I just like, I talk all the time. I talk to myself and I like, at least for those 20 minutes, I can shut down. So I try to like, you know, shut down a brain. But I'm also looking for physical experiences. Like, do I get goosebumps? Like, is God possibly touching me in a physical way? And should I be attuned to that? So again, I'm an idiot. I'm figuring it out slowly, but I hope that answers a question about like, you know, taking those steps for it. Hi, I just wanted to clarify, um, what's your reasoning behind uh, being 100% uh, in support of something that you only 60% believe in? Mm. And why choose a religion versus, you know, building your own worldview? And was this the same mindset you had when you chose math as the subject you wanted to study? Okay, those are three questions. Yes. Can you ask? The, okay, Sorry. I, I like it. I like it. I love that. Is the way to play the game. Uh, could you ask me the first one again? Just yeah. so I, yes, of course. Um, the first question was. Oh, the hundred percent thing. Yes. Yeah. So let's just actually talk about me getting in my car. I had to drive from San Diego, right, to Malibu, and as you're going up the five, like right when I got to LA, it was crazy rain. And I actually purposely came up a little earlier because I didn't want to get caught, you know, like, and they were like, I literally saw 15 to 20 wrecked cars on that drive. Usually I see one or two, right? But they're like cars on the side. I mean, just blinding rain. It went out. When I got in that car today, what's the chance, the probability that I'm going to make it alive to Malibu, right? And you could be like, ah, he's an okay, you got to know my driving record. And certainly my insurance company knows that stuff, but it is not 100%. Right? There's a chance that things can happen. So here I am, because of my infinite love for you and Matt, I gave up, sacrificed my life that wasn't 100% guaranteed to drive out here. But that's the risk you take all the time, right? So like, I'm getting in the car, but I'm 100% committed to get here, although the chance I'm going to make it isn't 100%. And when you talk about issues of faith, that probability goes way down, because I'm talking about issues of God and theology and universes when I know nothing. So if you really want that 60% number, it would be like 2%. I'm kind of 2% into the Christian faith, but atheism looks like 1%. I mean, like, because I know nothing about what the world is. I'm an idiotic kid talking about the infinite. That sounds quite arrogant for me to make truth claims. And so to me, that's the best I got. So that's what the, hopefully that 60% makes sense, meaning I got to choose something, right? But when I'm getting in the car, when I'm practicing my faith, whether it's you know, literal, whether I'm, a, whether I'm a skeptic and pushing against it, I'm still devoted to something. I've got to make some choices. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, my second question was, um, why choose a religion versus building yeah. your own worldview, yeah. like inspired by different things that, that makes sense? To my you? only answer to that is nobody is Switzerland. You can't be neutral. In the war in Ukraine right now today, 
If you decide, if you're following, let's, um, I know nothing about social media, but let's pretend there's something called Instagram, right? Either you like something or you don't, let's pretend your friend posts something, right? Your friend says, happy birthday or something like that. It's her birthday. Either you acknowledge the birthday and say, wonderful, or you give it a thumbs down. Am I mixing metaphors in it, whatever? But like, you know, you just don't like it. But if you actually don't say anything, that's actually a choice, your friend will realize you haven't commented on her birthday at all. Well, I didn't call her to wish her happy birthday, nor did I call her to piss her off. I just didn't call her at all. Well, that's a choice, right? If you do that to your mom, the fact you didn't call her is a choice you're doing. So I think that's why everybody's making a choice. Even if you decide not to have a worldview, deciding your worldview isn't important is a worldview. That's a pretty cool choice too. I mean, that's amazing, that's cool for you, but it's still a choice. Nobody gets to play the neutral card. One of my friends said, you know what, that's good for you, man. If Christianity works for you, that's great. To me, whatever works. That's pretty amazing to say that statement because I know a lot of people in a lot of faiths who would say Christianity and Islam are very different or Islam and Hinduism is very different or atheism. And my atheistic friends would say, that's offensive to me because I don't buy that junk that that guy's selling. So you can't equate things. And the moment my friend equated everything, he said he knows so much about all the worldviews he can see everything in front of him and he realizes they're all the same. That's a pretty amazing statement to say you know everything about everybody to say they're all the same. So you're always making choices. I hope that helps a little bit. So would you say, like, just to like, clarify, it was just a choice that you made? Exactly correct. He, okay. he has a, exactly, he has a worldview and his choice would be all worldviews of religions are the same. That's a pretty amazing statement that most people in the world would disagree with. But that is a statement. And would you say like this mindset of essentially um, just figuring out, like just making choices like this, is that the same mindset you had in choosing like math as your... As oh, for math as my thing? Man, you guys love math. Okay, if you guys want to talk about math, all right. It's, uh, I mean, I love math. Oh though. my <laughs> gosh, sweet. All right, so the way I chose math, I, I, I know this is being videoed, but I hope my wife never sees this, but the way I chose math is um, I loved Legos as a kid you know, like gears and pistons and like little Lego trains and like, you know, cars you can build. And I wanted to be a mechanical engineer. So Pepperdine has a program. I think uh, some of the students told me that you guys have a 3-2 program. You go to Pepperdine three years and you go to an engineering school two years and you get a couple of degrees, like a, like a liberal arts degree and an engineering. That's exactly what I did for my dinky college, right? So I did a 3-2 degree. It was a small college outside Chicago. And, uh, and so I wanted to do engineering. My dad's like, hey, just get the liberal arts thing. He was a professor at the small school. So he's like, it's free for three years, kid. You know, check that box out, right? And then go somewhere else. I did that. And I realized after three years that I could graduate. I had enough AP credits and all that kind of stuff that I could just graduate in three years. So instead of doing two more years, and then, as Matt and I were talking about, getting a PhD, right? Like instead of doing two more and then starting the train, I could just start the train right then and skip the whole, you know, engineering thing, which is what I did. So I basically wanted to get done with education. I just wanted to get my PhD, wanted to get rid of fourth grade and be done with it, right? Like that's all I wanted. And so the thing I could only go to grad school for was math, because that was the three year thing that I did, because I had to do math, you know, some kind of engineering thing, science-y thing. So I did math and I went to grad school at Johns Hopkins my first year, right? I was in grad school way over my head and I met this girl and she was Amazing, and my wife today is hotter than anything you could ever imagine. She's incredible. But she was there and she said, hey, you know what? What are you doing? I go, I'm a PhD student in math. She goes, I hate math. I said, I hate it too, it's awful. And so we got along and we got married and it's fantastic, except on the way there, I realized I love math. The moment I stopped doing classes and the moment I got to play and create my own mathematics, it was fantastic. And to me, the rush for education to me was not reading books, but making your own stuff. I love to make things. And so in math, as a PhD, you're creating your own mathematics that never existed. Oh my gosh, to me, that was me playing with the creator of the universe, where God comes to me and says, play with me, create with me. I am a creator and I made, no, you're made in my image, so you create with me. Oh my gosh, the rush. It's the difference between trying an ice cream that exists in an amazing ice cream place and you go to the scoop shop and you try all of them versus you making your own flavor. Oh, that's great. That's what happened.
That's amazing. Um, are we going to have time to like ask you more questions afterwards? Cause, like, I think, I yeah, I'll be around. Lot. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah, yeah. I just wanted to ask you about like all math and computer Yeah, we'll talk stuff. later. We'll talk yeah. later. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just had a quick question. So I really liked your comment about approaching things with skepticism as a way to think critically. But what would you have to say to someone that might use that approach to look at social issues like mm. racial discrimination and poverty? Could you explain, could you connect those two things for me? Like, what, what are you thinking about? Like, what would that person say? Would they be for or against? Like, yeah, like, for instance, if someone was looking at a study that quantified, um, like, socioeconomic status differences between different races and looked at it with skepticism, even mm. though there was scientific backing. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, how would you talk to somebody who might not buy into certain social issues or economic issues when they see studies? So there's a, there's a skeptical answer I have. <laughs> and the skeptical answer is usually studies don't do things justice. And what I mean by that is most of the things live in an embodied life. Like having grown up in India, the thing about India is I grew up in a middle class family where my parents are college professors. But yet we would hire, in, when I was a kid in India in the 80s and 70s, my mom would hire people off the street to wash dishes, to cook meals, to do laundry, not because she needed any of the help, but to give them dignity. There was just no way they can get work for being in certain classes of being untouchable. So she's like, I just want them to have a job. Like, to have it in, so like, just do at least this. Like, hey, rake some stuff, you know, do something like that. So I say that because so many times when we talk about issues of social justice or poverty or wealth, we talk about it in an academic sense. Even people who want issues of change talk about it in an academic sense. I think there's so much to be said about actually living an embodied life in the middle of that pain. Like, the biggest respect I get are people, like there's a guy named Father An Angel Rodriguez, I think that's his name, and I forgot where his restaurant is. He's a world-class chef, and what he decided to do was, for lunch, he would charge regular rates for all his customers, and for dinner, it would be only open to the homeless. And they would get the exact service that the people in lunch got. Silverware to the top notch, napkins, foldable, perfect cloth napkins, like everything to the top service, to say that their value as a human is equal. And to me, he has a right to come up on a stage like this and tell me what to do. But a study, I find really hard. I know there's important there's importances in studies and in documentation and all, I don't want to devalue that. But I think so much of the impact happens when you say, really, you don't think there's a difference? Come meet my friend. Like, let me give you some examples. Look, go to her home. Let's talk about what her family has gone through. Let's see what buying a home looks like for her and buying a home looks like for you. Let's go to a bank together. Like, to me, that's so much more powerful. Um, that doesn't dissuade the study part, but I think that's what gets to the heart of many people is if they know names. So would you say skepticism stems from inexperience and the inability of people to go out and change those inexperiences to experience? That could be part of it. And I think another part of it could be distance. I think the reason I'm not a fan of social media, the reason I'm actually very dangerously worried about newspapers, is that many times we get information from all over the world and we are overwhelmed and we shut down. Like, we just don't know how to make an impact but there is a way to make an impact if all you do is focus on your neighborhood. If literally all you do is take care of like the eight or nine homes around you, like if you live in a house, or the dorm around you, and you say, all I'm gonna do is worry and pray for and fight for these dorm mates, these sweet mates, I'm gonna shut down issues of Ukraine for now, I'm gonna shut down, I could listen to a blurb of it for a little bit, but 90% of my lifetime is gonna be obsessed with the way she is struggling with her mom the way she, you know, he is not getting along with his sister, the way her homework is dying. I'm going to pour my time into them. And I think transformation can really happen. I think we get just overwhelmed with information and we just don't know what to do with it. I'm really worried about social and technological issues today. You've talked about how it's, you, you made this decision to choose this one plane. But I don't think... One of the things I think that's really hard for this world that we live in is we know so much about the world. Like we know, mm -hmm. we can learn about Hinduism mm -hmm. in America. We can learn about Islam mm -hmm. in America. We can learn about it from any point we yes. are in the globe. And so what's confusing to us and honestly to me personally is 
how do I make this one choice? Mm. How is it that I have the right to sort through mm-hmm. these things? So my question is like, how did you, yeah. because you've made the decision and you're not certain on it because I don't think we ever can be fully certain, yeah. but why this plan? Can you maybe like give a little bit of reasons why the Christian plan is a plan you're on? Yeah, I mean, those are two separate things. The first part, I don't know. Again, as a kid who grew up in India, I have such high value for community, and I have such high value for wisdom and people who are older. Just usually wisdom and age are correlated. Not necessarily always, right? Sometimes you have a 20-year-old kid who knows how to think well, but most of the time it happens when you're like 50 and 60 and 70. So to me, it's listening to the elders and not the echo chamber of kids your age. So I think if you do want to understand Hinduism, I'd actually you know, go to people who are in their 40s and 50s and 60s and just hang out with them, get to know what their home is like. And same thing for, you know, for the different cultures, to kind of live in a life of people around you who have lived a long life um, and get to know them. So one of my friends used to say, you know, have you heard of a, a six-year-old um, music composer? You're like, yeah, I think Beethoven or Bach, didn't he write crazy things when you were like six or seven? Like, have you heard of like a six-year-old chess prodigy? You're like, yeah, their they're kids are like, you know, like six-year-old Rubik's Cube champions and six-year-old math prodigies, and the answer is yeah. And then he says, have you heard of a six-year-old art critic? You know, like, mm, I don't know. The, you know, like, what are you talking about, you idiot? Like, you're a six-year-old art critic? Like, you have to live a life before you understand how to critique art. But math and these other guys are so simple. So I think, like, living that embodied life with others w- would help understand some of those things. To me, let me answer the second part of it. To me, the Christian faith that... Here are a couple of things that I find ridiculously cool, and I'm just going to focus on like one small part, but if you look at the Jewish nation, they were looking for a Messiah. And if, even today, they're looking for a person to set the world right, and if you look at Jewish scripture, it's a pointer to it. And the thing about the Messiah during the time of Jesus was there were a lot of them. And the Messiah does, everybody knew at that time period, does three things. Like every Messiah has to do three things. They have to fix the temple. The temple is how you speak to God and it has to be built whole again. They have to bring justice and destroy the enemies and they have to bring peace. That's, that's the Trinitarian, every Messiah does it. And the simplest way to do that is, gosh, how do you fix a temple? So most Messiahs don't do that. Most Messiahs don't know how to bring peace, but gosh, they know how to bring justice. And the person at that time who's in power was Rome. So the first way that any Messiah does is they fight Rome. And it turns out all the messiahs got crucified. So, well, that sucks. And what the people usually do is, you know what? Peter was, we thought was the messiah, but it's his twin brother, Andrew. We were close, but we missed it by a little, right? Let's try, and then Andrew goes and he gets crucified. So this notion of messiah happened like this. And I find something amazing is Jesus said he was the messiah. People knew he was the messiah. The palm branches were laid, and then he got crucified. And afterwards, this is what I find funny, after crucifixion, his followers said he's still Messiah. Now that sounds stupid, because there have been a lot of people dead and his followers still said he was Messiah, so I find that weird. And the second thing I find even more weird is none of the three things were fixed. Like the temple was still broken and corrupt, there was still Rome, and there was still no peace. So. What the heck are they thinking? Now, we can look back now and say, well, they're thinking in a socioeconomic way of spiritual freedom. No, those are Jewish men and women. And so I find that absolutely weird that Jesus' brother James should have been picked. Man, Jesus didn't work out, man, but James should have done it. But they didn't, and I, I find that really weird. And the last thing I would say is this notion of the Trinity that Jesus was actually God on earth is despicable in a monotheistic world. And if you look at what the Jewish nation was, they were surrounded by polytheism. Babylon, Assyria, Rome. Rome says BYOG, right? Bring your own God. Like, we'll take it all. And you know exactly what the people of the nation of Israel said. We know how much polytheism is and all these other. We will never have but one God, the Shema, Deuteronomy, right? Like it says, there will be one God for the nation of Israel. And in the midst of that world comes the Christian faith about the fact that God is now man? That's silly. Dude, dude, the fact that Jesus existed and became man would have been fine in Hinduism. We'd take him, right? We got Shiva, Vishnu, we just take that other guy too, that's great. But the fact it happened in monotheistic land of diehardness, so there's so many things as an example to me, that just like makes me say, okay, look a little deeper, dude, because something is weird going on here. So I can go more, but that's an example of what attracted me to it. Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question about 
um, evangelism and how do you talk to people about Christianity in the science world? Oh, in the science world? Oh, gosh. Um, when, when you say the science world, do you mean like faculty or do you mean students or do you mean like academic life in general? Yeah, maybe or? like academia. I think... I really don't think the science world is the problem, in all honesty. I think it ha it's just sort of our world. Like, we like, I don't know, I mean, there's more philosophical issues behind the scenes that I, this is just me on a rant, so now you have to kind of keep me focused a little bit, but we have gotten to the point where we enjoy quick turnaround time. We don't want long burn. We want articles that we can read rather than lives we can live. We want to know a thousand people rather than know three who have our back. And because of that, the thing that makes things really short and quick is science and math. Technology will give things to you really fast. That's what we can act. Literally, what I'm saying is you could put man on the moon and a woman in Mars because that's easy to do. The harder things is these other things. So I think because we value this quick turnaround time, we keep valuing scientists more and more. And because we value scientists more and more, all of a sudden we think that science is the only lens in which to view the world. So Richard Dawkins says somehow, like with, even Bertrand Russell was talking about this 100 years ago, about the notion that science is the language of truth. Like if you really want to know truth, it has to be done through a scientific lens. To me, that's nuts. And I think most scientists would be like, yeah, that's crazy too. But the world views it that way now because science is, they are the ones giving us cocaine and we like the hit. They give us a new iPhone and it's better, and we like the hit. So we keep honoring those in the sciences and in the computational world and in the mathematical world, and we define everything we do based on those things. So now we start saying things like, um, so the scripture, I wonder how scientific Genesis is. Then we talk about evolution when it was not even meant to be talked about. Then we talk about how scientific other things are in scripture when it wasn't designed that way. So to me, the science community I don't think has a problem in itself. I think community has a problem. And I want to say a word about the arts and the humanities. They've always been a notion of checks and balances. They were all equal viewpoints. Certainly in the Renaissance, you can go from one to the other one. But because science has become so valuable, now we never ask whether we should do it. We just ask whether we could do it. And the humanities and the arts would say, you are an idiot. Like, you can't be doing that stuff. And the artists would speak into our lives and say, take a check on it. Musicians are doing that today, right? Hollywood, in a little bit, is doing that today to speak into our lives, but really the power of the science is we are just in love with Tesla, and we're in love with Musk, and like all of those kind of things, rather than what the arts and the humanities are keeping a check on. And because the one thing that's keeping the scientists in check is gone, then this becomes too powerful. The scientists are doing exactly what they should be doing, which is keeping asking nerdy questions, like I want to keep asking nerdy questions, but nobody's there to keep them in check. That's my worry. Uh, so you spoke about um, different things in Christianity where maybe 60% of it you buy into and then 40% you don't. Just, you know, those are the numbers you used. Sure. Um, I'm wondering, what are some of those things in your, your life uh, that you think don't make sense? In the yeah, Christian that's Bible? a great question. Um, I think some issues of how... Um, so, you know, when we talk about issues of God's power... I don't even want to, I'm not even talking about predestination issues. I just mean that how holy and powerful and great God is and this notion of time scale. Like I see the notion of suffering and it's not like God will one day return. He's coming soon. It's like, dude, what's up? Is this real? And then I think of the notion of historical time. Like, did it really happen? I mean, I get some of the historical things about Jesus and some of the historical things about David, but then I had something like, really? Like, that happened? Mm. So that's kind of funny. Issues of sexuality. Like, there's like, okay, in the current 21st century America today, we have issues of sexuality that are kind of like countercultural to the scriptural notions of some of those things. They go, yeah, is that, are they getting it right or do we kind of have it? Like, aren't we kind of figuring it out more? What's up with Paul? So there are some tensions that I have, having grown up in India, valuing elders and valuing a community life, but at the same time, now I'm a San Diego kid, right? It's, it's different, man. And I'm reading books written thousands of years ago about a time and a space that's not this. It's hard for me to keep a lot of that in check and, and kind of buy into it. But overall, the stories are making sense to me. And overall, my life seems to be fulfilled in certain ways compared to the other truths of the world today. And overall, things that I find incredibly gorgeous 
this Christian faith values it and says, yeah, it is gorgeous. In fact, here's why there's still brokenness in the world today and war, and here's why one day it'll be set right. If you watch a movie like The Godfather, which I tell my students all the time, if you haven't seen The Godfather, there's nothing in class I can teach you that's better. So actually, drop my class, leave now, go watch one and two and come back. And like, there's this notion of justice in The Godfather. Like, when something happens, you want to fight back. Why is that? And there's this notion of like wanting to set the world right. That if God, if that's in your heart, what's up, dude? <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> I don't see it. So, and half of Psalms is that. And half of Job is that. So, Right. Well, I'm glad uh, you didn't recommend your uh, students to watch The Godfather Part 3. So oh, yeah. That. <laughs> I've never seen it, so I can't, I can't comment. So, yeah. Thanks. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I had a question related to... Um, I, I know there's like a lot of questions related to what you said about like believing most of Christianity, but not everything. And I think a mm. huge part of Christianity is evangelism mm. and like going out into all the nations and like preaching, mm. mm-hmm. um, like telling about the gospel. But how do you kind of, I guess, like understand that, yes, this is your personal worldview, but I guess according to the Bible, like a lot of our duty as Christians is to go out and tell other people. So how do you like bridge Mm -hmm. the gap of, I don't know all the answers and there are things I disagree with, but I still want to kind of like spread the gospel. I don't know if that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Your questions about Christianity, evangelism, our calling, how we do this thing when there's, when we're in a very, there are people who are far smarter, far, far smarter and have thought so clearly about this thing uh, that, um, like, Miroslav Volf, he's a professor at Yale in theological seminary, but he kind of thought, thinks deeply about the kind of world we live in. The, and, oh my gosh, it's, um, so I don't want to, I think it'll be an, a huge disservice to distill his work down and, and give you tidbits. So I could, after the talk, I could point you to some of the stuff that he's done as an example, right, uh, on, on how to, not, not, polytheism, but like a world that is post-everything. It's a very weird world today. Um, To me personally, one is my home. When people come to my home, I want them to be in Eden. That's what I want. That's it. It's just like, I want them to feel like, where am I? Like, the garden we have in the back, it should be Eden on earth. Like, that's my wife. She is a prophet who literally walks the earth, and she transforms that place that way. I want the warmth. I want the understanding. I want food. I want smells. Like, I want to knock you out, and I want my, my friends to say, I don't want to leave. Like, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Through my kids, I want to do that. That they are, I have very little interest in them as people. Forgive me for saying these things. That could be edited out. But they are weapons of war. They are here to transform the world. I am giving whatever I can to empower them to bring heaven on earth today. Every step they take should look like brilliant earth breaking down the new heaven coming forward. The littlest one, the girl we adopted, her name is Jerusalem. That's what we named her because she is, to me, heaven on earth. Where What she speaks will happen. So that's my home life. But my work, the notion of taking a sculpture to Burning Man, I know when I first told this to my university, it's, USD is like a, it's a Catholic school. It's kind of like echoing Pepperdine from the Catholic realm. They're like, dude, you're taking kids to Burning Man? Like, we know what Burning Man is. Like, they do drugs a lot. And I was like, well, who else but us? I mean, like, why can't we bring amazing, glorious, beautiful mathematics, amazing unsolved problems, and just a beautiful sculpture there? Why not us? And so, like, that's what it looks like. So if you want me to talk about what my work looks like, it looks like that. It looks like the math studio. Like, why can't we have an embodied life in math? So to me, it's not a witness of, come, let's talk about scripture together. That could happen any time, over drinks and over food. But it really is that, that framing. So, my pleasure. Um, so I have two questions, if that's okay. Yeah, um, the first one, going back to the thing about the 60%, um, I am also of the belief that you can't really commit to something that you're fully certain in, and I think sometimes you have to commit without mm-hmm. being fully certain. Yes. Uh, I was wondering if you think that maybe God made it this way where you can't be 100% certain, mm. and somehow that's better for us. Mm. Oh, I, there's no way I can look into the mind of God. So I can't answer that question. I mean, maybe through scripture you could, there are people here far, oh my gosh, who have thought through that stuff maybe better. The, the only thing that kind of comes to mind is in the Garden of Eden, where 
you know, God says, like, you know, there's a bunch of food, just don't eat this one. And I think there's nothing glorious about the tree he picked. I think just the fact, if he said, you're not supposed to eat food at all, oh, and by the way, there's this amazingly hot, brilliant pizza right here, just don't eat it, and you have to suffer for 10 years before, it's like, that would be a different kind of a test, but that's not the test he had. He gave them everything they wanted, and he had to give them something to define what love was. And the only way they would actually eat other food is because they wanted to eat food. That's not showing love to God. That's just taking care of themselves. So actually, the only way to define love to God is not just doing what makes them happy and flourishing with what he wants. What he wants is what they want. So how can you possibly tell the difference? Is literally come up with a stupid rule. I think the rule is really dumb. He's like, uh, that tree, just don't eat it. And that's my notion of it. It's like, what's so special about that? I'm just nothing. It's just like the same as the other one. Just don't eat that one. He just had to come up with something to define that stuff. So I think there's enough things on the issues of when you're saying, is God asking us to you know, take that big leap of faith? I don't know. But I do know we live in a broken world that we are post-Eden. And so my mind is messed up as to what God's real intentions are. Pre-Eden... He made it amazingly glorious. The test that he has for us was so simple that it was not even a big leap. It's just eating a tree that looks like this one. He doesn't want a crazy life. He wants a joyous life for us without these crazy tests. But now we're in the world of shadows, so it's hard for me to answer. And then I was also wondering about, you made this connection from math to religion. And I know that Plato makes kind of a similar connection, but it's a little different in the sense that I feel like Plato is talking about how math is this like abstract idea, which then connects to religion. But you made it seem like it's math is this like very real yes. idea. So I was wondering what your thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, I mean, in one sense, I know I said in the very beginning that you know, no matter what triangle you draw, the angles add up to 180. And I made it sound like I was cool and stuff, but it really, nobody's ever drawn a perfect triangle. We've all drawn triangles, but nothing is a mathematical triangle. In fact, every triangle you measure isn't going to add up to 180. Nothing. In fact, it's the worst. <laughs> like, all our triangles that you do are awful, because my triangle is the perfect triangle, like, where the, angle, where the edge lengths are zero thickness, and they come perfectly, and that's a mathematical notion. And so my math world is literally leaving this world and being in a world that's kind of parallel to it, but per perfect. Like, I could do whatever. I could play any game I want. And the cool thing is all these things are related to these ideas somehow. Like the worlds are kind of parallel. If I do these cool things, it might be related to something here. And I love this kind of interplay. To me, that's this notion of applications. Like how do they fit together? So I love working with architects. When I built a chicken coop with a friend of mine, I said, dude, we have chickens and we need to build a coop and he's an architect. And uh, he's like, and I showed him some plans online. He's like, those suck. So he like just designed his own chicken coop based on a Frank Gehry design. It's Incredible, except I had to build it based on this design. And I have never built anything in my life. So I just went to Home Depot and I started putting like, you know, two by fours on a, tr on a cart. He's like, what are you doing? I'm putting two by fours on a cart, dude, to build a chicken coop. He's like, did you check if they're straight? He's like, what are you talking? Just put two by fours. Like, there's a two by four. There's a it's like, you know, you put it on the floor and you roll it to make sure it's straight. You know, like, two by fours come in different cuts. I had no idea. I thought, like, let x equals 2 by 4. I need 17x, right? I'm just putting them on the thing. He's like, no, physical things are different than stupid things in your head. Like, you got to touch them. And so you realize most of the life is physical, but my life is kind of theoretical in our world. Michael Pogliani, this brilliant philosopher, he says that everything we do is an embodied thing. Like, all knowledge is embodied. Do you know why? Even my mind is embodied here. It comes through my eyes, through my hands. Like, whatever we talking, it's through physical things. So I could think it's platonic, right? This distant, floating thing. But it's an embodied experience from you to me that I'm gaining knowledge. So even if I float away in my head, it's through the body that I got it from. So somehow body is so important. And I don't know of another faith statement that echoes it so much in the Christian one. So, Thank you. Thanks. All right, I think we're going to do one last question. Make it good, Parker. <laughs> I'll try. Um, thank you for being with us tonight. Um, I think a lot of young people, many students in this room, um, and many on this campus that come from faith backgrounds uh, are processing in what now has become a bit of a buzzword in deconstruction. Mm. Uh, so they're wondering what their faith means to them now, um, out from their maybe parents' wings, um, and they're processing these things. Yeah. And you've spoken so much to the beauty of embodied practices, both in community and relationship. So I wonder, what would you, or how could you offer 
um, healthy embodied practices of skepticism that can help students wrestle with these questions about fear and doubt and mm. faith um, in ways that keep them healthfully you know, attached to community in processing these things. Oh my gosh. So in fact, thank you for saying that word deconstruct because that's the word I didn't understand on the title. It's like it had disbelief as like, and doubt and it had deconstruction. It's like, oh, what is deconstruction? Again, math is the weaker stuff, right? Like we deal with silly stuff. So I didn't even understand that word. So thanks for explaining it a little bit for me. That helps. Um, do you guys, have you, if this is a spoiler, well, too bad for you, but like, have you guys all read or know about Harry Potter? So you know there's something, in Harry Potter, there's the Horcrux. Isn't that true? Do you know like the, it's like a splitting of the soul and Voldemort does it seven times and Harry Potter's main quest is to destroy six of them so he can finally kill the last one. I think that is exactly a beautiful description of social media. That if you have an Instagram account, you've split your soul and you have a Horcrux. And if you have Facebook, there's a splitting of your soul. Like every account you have is a splitting of your soul because you need to feed it. You need to feed that thing to keep it a little alive. Because if you stop doing stuff on Instagram, that dies. Nobody's going to follow you and you just fade away. Twitter, you've got to feed that. And so to me, my encouragement in this very weird, technologically horcruxed world would be to live lives where you can eat food with one another. I mean, when you actually sit down to eat with one another, like burn your phone. Like I physically don't carry a phone. Like I, I have it in my backpack because it's a GPS to get home and then I just put it away. And because the most important thing is nobody wants to call me and I don't care. I don't care uh, anyway. So I have a phone in my office so you can call me then. But uh, in general, I would love this body of people in this generation to be so transformative that they can love somebody by looking at them in their eyes and smiling at them rather than looking at the phone when they're walking down the street. To invite them to their home and realize, oh, I don't even care what's on social media for the next two hours. I just want to hang out with you. Like, what are you up to, man? What kind of food do you want? Let's cook pasta together. Like, I think the little acts would be so transformative. My favorite verse or part in the Bible, uh, or chapter in the Bible is Luke 24. This is after the resurrection. Like, nobody understood what the resurrection is. Nobody understood how a Messiah could come back. Like, it's just, Jesus literally walks through the wall, and he's like, what's up? And they're like, ah! And they're like, ghost, because can't physically be a person. And he goes, no, no, touch it, check it out. His next words are, do you have any food? I thought he'd be like, and this is what heaven is like, and blessings to you. I'm like, nothing. It's like, dude, do you have any food? They're like, we have some fish. And he sat down and he ate the fish. He's like, I'm hungry. What the? And I think that's a great pointer to what the new world could be. Can we just literally live an embodied life where we sit and look at each other and hang out with each other? I'd love it. I think it'd be so transformative. All righty, thank you everyone for your questions. Round of applause for the great questions. Thank you, Dr. Kevin does. Uh, I wish we could get to more, but he'll also be hanging around afterwards, so feel free to mingle and talk with him some more. And I believe you have some closing remarks. Uh, sure, yeah, and I mean, then Zach yeah, and no, that's great. That was a great up. question. Um, the <laughs> only thing I guess I wanted to say to encourage you, I, this story I heard, which I thought was amazing. I don't know if you guys know who Karl Barth is, but he's like a brilliant Bible scholar in the past century. And uh, this astronomer comes to him and he says, uh, Dr. Barth, I just want to let you know that isn't it true that all religions, kind of what we're talking about, about the different planes, like aren't they all sort of saying the same thing? And Karl Barth, who spent basically his entire life thinking about the Bible, is kind of blown away that every religion in the world is sort of the same. He goes, my friend, like, what is this thing that all these religions are saying? Like, he goes, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Like, isn't that kind of it? I mean, Hinduism, Buddhism, Shintoism, if you kind of take it all, that's what it's doing, right? He thought about it for a little bit, and he goes, yeah, you know, now that, now that you mention it, well, isn't it true that kind of all of astronomy can also be thought of in a sentence? And this guy's like, wait, what? Quasars and pulsars and black holes and cosmos and galaxies innumerable? What sentence are you talking about that could encapsulate all of astronomy? And he goes, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder where you are. And Barth was basically saying, you can deconstruct it into a sentence, but the complexity is so much more. And my encouragement to you is, like, live in a life that values this complexity. 
Like, don't go into the Twitter world and make it into small little blurbs. Live into that life. That's my encouragement. Thanks.